Hi, my name is Stacy. And I'm Olivia. And we're making a cake, right? Yes. Olivia Gant was a charming little girl born on June 21, 2010, and lived in Pasadena, Texas, with her parents, and two sisters. Olivia's mother was Kelly Renee Turner Gant, 43 years of age at the time of the incident. Kelly started bringing Olivia to the hospital when she was very young, claiming the girl was suffering from neurogastrointestinal encephalomyopathy. According to Kelly Turner, Olivia was not responding positively to the numerous treatments and surgeries she underwent. With little hope of survival, Olivia made a list of things she wanted to do before dying. She's in um, intestinal failure and we don't know how much longer she has and so we made a bucket list and one of her things was to become a firefighter. Let's see how far we can get it to go. And we got to do that so they have to check it off. Thanks for being a great boss. Awesome. Her condition moved people's hearts, and on many occasions, the community showed generosity to Olivia and her mother. At first glance, Olivia's story seemed to be a simple one, but there was something dreadful happening behind doors that shocked everyone when it finally came to light. I had no reason to believe that what Kelly was telling us was not true, because to us she was in the best care she could be in. She convinced us that it was the best, the doctors said it was going to be the best thing for her, and we had no reason not to believe him. I mean, she's at one of the best frickin' hospitals in the country. I don't think she has, I think she's just mentally ill. She, you can't believe anything she said. Everything that she has said to us is nothing what's the truth we have found out since this has happened. The Munchausen syndrome is a psychological disorder where a person either pretends to be sick or hurts himself to attract attention from others. They crave to be the center of attention, therefore they play the sick role. The Munchausen syndrome by proxy differs from the first because in this case, the person who suffers from this disorder inflicts deliberately harm on another person, usually someone related to them or in their care. In this way, they still receive the same amount of attention, but indirectly. Child abuse. Olivia was born on the 21st of June 2010. Two years later, her mother left Texas with her children and moved to Colorado. In 2012, Kelly Turner brought Olivia for the first time to the Children's Hospital Colorado's Anschutz Medical Campus. Kelly said Olivia was having troubles digesting food and was constipated. Doctors removed a hardened stool from her colon and Olivia was sent home. After that day, Kelly kept bringing Olivia to the hospital, claiming she was unable to eat. For two years, Olivia made constant visits to the hospital, until in 2014 when doctors performed a radical surgery on her digestive system. They rerouted her small intestine to bypass her large intestine, so that waste went into a bag through a hole in her stomach. According to Kelly, this helped with the constipation, but Olivia was still having problems digesting the food. Doctors then performed a TPN. The installation of a feeding tube sending nutrients directly into Olivia's veins. In the span of a year, Olivia had three different types of feeding tubes installed on her body. In 2015, Olivia was sent to Boston Children's Hospital for a second opinion. At this point, she had already multiple feeding tubes and an ileostomy bag installed. The Boston specialist said Olivia was a healthy child and did not need any of the treatments. He recommended the ileostomy to be reversed, and to stop giving narcotics to Olivia. However, the doctors from the hospital in Colorado ignored this report and continued with the treatments. During the time Olivia was hospitalized, Kelly convinced doctors to prescribe an anti-seizure medication called Keppra. Kelly managed to get the prescription even if medical records said doctors had never witnessed the girl having a seizure. For years, doctors kept treating Olivia based solely on statements made by her mother. I started getting very, very worried because I didn't, I, I, I didn't believe her because there were discrepancies that just didn't quite make sense. And in medicine, the tests are not perfect. We have stuff like this all the time that you're like, well, really? Maybe we should repeat that test because it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. But it was just one after another after another, right? You know, when you ask for the small bowel, the small bowel transit looks amazing. And, you know, this, there's a stool coming out of every orifice. And nobody sees that. Comes into the hospital several times and nobody notes that or writes that down, right? Then, of course, the dev note. And then I see that, that there's more and more... Uh, and she's, oh, no, no, we're using it very sparingly. But I can see is, you know, with dark glasses playing in her computer, not the same. 
there was playing with me, right? Yeah. I mean, Monday morning, quite around right at the time. In fact, I was just in the hospital. I just had surgery, right? Yeah. So there's always a feasible or possible explanation. Pain, we have no test for pain, right? So the mother said, she's in terrible pain. And then I even said, she looks pretty good. Oh, a good day. 30 doctors might have taken care of this kid or more. Yes. And somehow, right, yep. she navigated these waters. Well, I, I have to say, I think that this is, this is the perfect diagnosis to lie. Why do you say that? Because our tests for motility are far from perfect, right? And motility testing is already compromised by a child that has a lot of surgery and narcotics, and, right? So now you don't even know if it's cause or effect, right? Yeah. It's very hard to make a diagnosis, the plumbing part of it. For pain, we have nothing, right? Nothing. You just have to take somebody's word for it. Um, so uh, it's very easy. It's very easy to lie. And if you read Rob's first notes for a long time, he's constipated. Yeah. Like a million other kids. <laughs> It's chronic constipation, mostly from probably withholding. Yeah, that's all. And and then it escalates and it escalates and it escalates. And this medical system that is so divided with so many specialists now that you you will have thirty people involved, right? And we're not having medical meetings all in one room. I don't know half the doctors that have taken care. Of it. Yeah. Right? It's just the size. Yeah. So of, of course we're not in communication. We the he says she says so easy. Okay. If the, if she says oh the surgeon said this, I, I, unfortunately I'm probably not going to take the time to call the surgeon and say did you really say that? Because we just we just we just can't or we don't. I mean unless we suspect. I think we didn't detect it in time. Early. These constant medical treatments and surgeries affected Olivia's health. On several occasions, either she needed a wheelchair to leave the bedroom, or she became bed-bound for weeks. During this time, Kelly would take pictures of Olivia and post them on Facebook to gather sympathy from people. In March 2017, medical staff caught Kelly red-handed when she was trying to discard the ileostomy bag. In response, the doctors order a hospital staff to be always present when Kelly was in the bedroom with Olivia. A few weeks later, Kelly started asking Olivia's doctors to sign a do not resuscitate order. Olivia's doctors refused to sign the request. Kelly then changed the medical staff in charge of her daughter and found a doctor who was willing to sign the order. And my understanding at that, at that time was that when he came in, um, it appeared that he had a lot of sedating type medications and we had been slowly withdrawing some of those medications. We were still giving some of them, but um, at decreased doses. And as we did that, and it was perking back up and was awake and talking to people and were, was interactive with people um, and seemed you know, to kind of go back to the patient that we knew or were familiar with, I guess. Um, and at that point, I believe Kelly <coughs> wanted to continue with the hospice care and wanted to start withdrawing other care, such as feedings and things like that. And um, when that happened, some of my nursing staff came to me and they were somewhat upset with that decision. Um, they didn't feel that that seemed appropriate based off of where currently was. I mean, at that point, she was asking, she was asking, she got to go home. She was definitely, I think, more interactive and more engaging. And um, they came to me and were concerned with that. Ethics did come in and explain, you know, based off of, um, her diagnosis based off the symptoms that we feel like she's experiencing at home, the information that we had gathered from Kelly that this was appropriate, that it meant a definition of um, being something that would be life-ending. And so 
based off of the information that they had. That's why they were supporting um, that decision. Um, and on heroic doses of narcotics, heroic doses. Um, though you sneak up on that, right? You know, yeah. So, although that none of us would survive, I don't think the doses that she was receiving for. Yeah. Um, even if we split them, okay, yeah. between the three of us. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, um, but that was a, a scenario where, where, where I was really taken aback, and I'm saying, well, all right, well, this girl stood up on the gurney and gave me a hug, if I remember correctly, in the ER at the time of the mission, and 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 I'm saying, okay, well, where does the DNR come from, and, and who who's does not have a quality of life, and and all of this piece, and. And uh, and I had frank conversations with mom that went kind of shockingly well. Um, I think palliative care was was there with this when I had to tell her that I'm I'm not comfortable with this. I cannot sign this DNR. And and I told her I can't trust you to tell me that she has no quality of life. All right. And and uh, and I think I probably said uh, it doesn't matter who you are. You know uh, I'm not going to trust you to be the only voice for. This. Uh, and tell me that uh, that doesn't uh, doesn't deserve everything that we would offer for another child here. Um, and we also talked about well, what do you do in this scenario? Okay, and uh, and there were some meetings, and I called an ethics uh, consult, um, and uh, 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 and and had meetings with uh, palliative care, and then eventually with a colleague. Um, uh, took over her care because I, I, I just wasn't comfortable with that scenario. And and in those conversations, we talked about well, what do you do with this, right? You know, where, where you don't know. And, and 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 I was clear about all right, I don't know uh, intestinal failure as dysmotility or not. Um, and there is no test I could do to do that other than to challenge this. And we had conversations, and I don't even remember who. Who was involved in which ones? But uh, about well, okay, you hospitalize. Or, well, if you hospitalize, and and a parent, Kelly or otherwise, is in that room at all, okay, well, that's not going to be a very good test, right? So what do you um and do you another placement? Um, and uh, and wow, that's an enormous step. I think the last admission, there was. Uh, Close to, despite the many, <laughs> the many hours that day, um, the uh, there really was no um, substantial discussion about about signs or symptoms. There, it okay. was it was really all about okay, we have a DNR. This is a horrible situation in my mind, and um, I don't think we should have a DNR. And I can't find anyone who, tell, who could tell me why we should have a DNR. Um, and I sought out people, who, and that was the focus of the last admission. And, and in the end, uh, you know, I remain very, very uncomfortable with the situation and care. I mean, I've never been in a situation where I refuse somebody's care. I've never heard of that before. Um, We have two pathways. We can say mom has kids' best interests in heart, and we've done what we can medically speaking, and we will respect the wishes to transfer to hospice and withdraw care, or we call DHS and pursue much health diagnosis. And that, as I'm sure you guys know, is a significant uphill battle without wonderful documentation, and um, and no one felt like that was. You know, they're never cut and dried, but no one felt it fit the right picture for that. You know, people that knew her, mom was a little quirky. She might have had a bipolar, butter personality type disorder, but that doesn't mean that she doesn't have best interest in heart. So we couldn't base our decision on, on a perceived mental health diagnosis she may or may not have. Um, I guess in hindsight, we maybe made the wrong choice. Um, but at the time, and everybody I talked to, including our ethics team, 
um, including our GI service, we all felt that we, we didn't really have this. What I mean, th- this was the right decision. You know, that it, it was our decision to to allow her to pursue this, and that she had interests at heart were were in alignment with proper medical um, care. And I think we all kind of begrudgingly agreed that we had to respect that, and and we let it happen. I even went and saw hospice and. Um, Kelly was appropriate. She was distraught, but but at peace with her decision. I don't know that we would have done anything different put in that situation. Obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty. But again, you know, as much as I can be off the record, I feel absolutely terrible about this. And, you know, it's it's the what if, what what could we have done differently? How could we have seen this coming? What could we have done? Could we have prevented this? Could we have gotten obviously someone involved earlier, maybe and. Well, I, I guess basically we, we call we call child protective services, and and they take it from there. And um, for what it's worth, um, I, I mean, I have a social worker on my team. We we, we definitely have times when we call them. It is not to fault the system; it's very hit or miss. Uh, I've seen, I've had families in Stapleton have their kids taken away because they're playing in the park across the street. I've had kids of meth addicts who the report was filed three times and nothing happened. So I, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, not the, it's not a perfect system by any means. No system is. But it's a, really, it's a really tough thing to do because what I'm basically saying, if I'm going to say we're going we're gonna to go down one child this route, I'm saying you're, you're not parenting your child correctly, not only that, but you're putting them in harm's way. We're taking your child away. And... And investigating them because if you know if we do open a, D, a, a, a CPS case, um, they're the first thing they're going to do is is that investigation, and we've got to have documentation in place, you know. And if I just started now, it's the day one of where you want to do this, um, I better have great records going back a long time. I better have a lot of places where I said this doesn't feel right. There's a, you know there's a split between medical and, and, and what mom's saying. And I don't know that any of us had that enough to really push for it. And again, it's one of those diagnoses that you better be sure. You better be sure you're doing that. You can't just be like, well, maybe. If we're going to pull that trigger, sorry to use an no, okay. appropriate term, you know what I mean, though, right? Yeah. You pull the trigger, the trigger's pulled. Yeah. You know, you do that, and we're saying you're an unfit mother. You're doing something wrong, right? Again, hindsight's 2020. Clearly, maybe we should have said something or looked into it further. I, knowing what I know now, obviously, a different story. Knowing what I knew then, we would have done the same thing 100% of the time. Um, you know, I, it is so... It's so tough to think that that a parent doesn't have their child's best interest in mind. Um, it's so difficult to assume that that they that they are they're lying to me, that they're fabricating. You know, and and again, this is this is probably the 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 presumptuous optimism of a physician. You know, I I, I assume. You know, I'm I'm on the people are good side of things. That being said, I see the underbelly all the time. Yeah. You know, you know where I'm coming from. It's there, and I know I see it. But I, I, I we we as a medical community, when people come to us for help, we assume they really need help, and 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 it's it's. I I don't know what it looks like personally. I have not made that phone call. Um, we have had patients historically who have ended up getting that diagnosis. Um, the occasional patient that I worry about, I dot my T's and I cross my I's and I make sure my documentation is pristine so that if it does come up, and this is one of those, right, you know, I hope that I documented everything perfectly that that because that, I know it's gone over with a fine tooth comb. I just... Yeah, again, doing it all over again, I don't know that I would have done anything differently. Um, 
is this going to change my practice in the future? Am I going to start going on social media? I don't know that I want to do yeah, that. So I, don't, I don't know what we're encouraging that. And, and just, <laughs> just to be crystal clear, uh, we're, we're not approaching this investigation at all from the perspective that there was any nefarious attempt on the part of anybody yeah. in children. I know, I know, I understand uh, that. I just, I just feel awful about it. I mean, it's, you know, I, I'm facing, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Once she had the order signed, Kelly ordered hospital staff to remove Olivia's feeding tubes from her, and she took Olivia to a hospice to die. She is an intestinal failure. We were in the hospital for about a month and came home on hospice, so she made a bucket list of things she would like to do in order to hopefully fulfill all of her wishes, because, you know, we don't know how much longer she has. I'm not sure, you know, if Kelly or anybody else told her anything about what a bucket list meant. Without the feeding tubes, Olivia started slowly to starve. It has been reported that initially, Olivia was in a good mood. But this changed later when she began to starve. I mean, worries for the rest of your days. She didn't know she was going to die. She was happy to get out of that hospital and get all those tubes out of her and, uh, you know, feel like a normal child. She was kept under potent drugs and given nothing to eat, but melted popsicle juice rubbed on her lips with a sponge. Lonnie Gautreau, Olivia's grandfather, stated she was lucid the last time he saw her. Two days before she died, I was in a hospice, and I was holding her little hand, and she was on these heavy narcotics, and the only thing they were giving her was popsicle juice, you know, and, and toward the end, on a sponge even. And I was holding her hand, and she opened her eyes, and she recognized me immediately, and says, Papa, I'm hungry. That put another dagger in my heart. What was she thinking when I didn't do anything? You know, her mother said, take a little popsicle juice on the sponge and put it on her lips and stuff, you know? But what was she thinking of me not giving her food or feeding her, you know? And that haunts me every single night since I found out she was not terminally ill and she wasn't even sick and they tortured her for five years. It haunts me every single night. Olivia died on the 20th of August 2017, according to her mother by an intestinal failure. Olivia was seven years of age at the time of her death. Doctors believe now that Olivia was never ill. It was the strong medication she was taking and the drastic treatments Olivia had to undergo that made her weak. During the five years of Olivia's illness, she spent most of that time under heavy narcotics, she was taken over a 1,000 documented hospital visits and underwent over 25 unnecessary surgical procedures. With this non-existence illness Kelly made up, she defrauded Medicaid in $500,000. In addition to the medical abuse, Kelly told everyone that Olivia was terminally ill. Then she used other sympathy to scam them. In particular charity organizations with the only purpose to help others in need. Kelly posted Olivia's bucket list of things she wanted to do before her death. The organization Make-A-Wish Foundation and other local groups, made an effort to make Olivia's bucket list a reality. This included a bat princess party and other events where Olivia would get to pretend to be a firefighter and a police officer for a day. It's estimated that Kelly scammed between $100,000 and $1 million in charity money and gifts. Investigation. After Olivia's death, there was no investigation regarding the case. But a year later, in 2018, Kelly Turner brought her other daughter to the hospital. Kelly was complaining that Olivia's sister had prior cancer, and now the girl had bone pain, so she was concerned the cancer had returned. After having looked at the child, the doctor understood that Kelly's statement did not make sense. So he followed the standard of care. He called the prior hospital and found out that what Kelly was telling was not true. Then he called the social services. The social services removed both girls from Kelly and the authorities started an investigation. Kelly Turner was arrested in 2019 facing charges of first-degree murder, theft, charitable fraud, forgery and attempting to influence a public servant. Sentence. A few weeks before going to trial, Kelly Turner accepted a plea deal. Kelly pleaded guilty to a felony charge of child abuse that negligently caused her daughter's death. Kelly also pleaded guilty to the charge of theft and fraud. These sentences to be served concurrently. In 2022, Kelly Turner was convicted and sentenced to 16 years in prison for the death of her daughter. 
Later, Kelly affirmed she was innocent of all the charges, and that she had only pleaded guilty to spare her family the stress of a lengthier trial. Aftermath. Kelly lost the custody of her two other daughters as a result of the conviction. The oldest daughter, who was brought into Children's Hospital Colorado in early 2018 for what Kelly had claimed was bone pain, had no further symptoms. Civil lawsuit. Olivia's surviving family blamed the Children's Hospital Colorado for her death and they sued the hospital for $25 million. The victim's family in this case have grave concerns that medical providers did not protect Olivia Gant, that they signed orders withdrawing her care and signed orders for her to be sent to Denver Hospice. So the victim's family, it's very important to them to find out all of the facts and circumstances, not only about her care, but the circumstances surrounding her death. According to Olivia's grandparents, the hospital staff not just failed to detect Kelly's suspicious behavior, as they encouraged it. 1. Doctors prescribed an anti-seizure medication for Olivia even if the girl had never seen having a seizure during the entire time she was in the hospital. 2. Doctors performed multiple digestive surgeries on Olivia even if a specialist reported Olivia had no problems digesting food, and that she was actually healthy. 3. A doctor signed a do not resuscitate order even if the doctors in the care of Olivia said she was not terminally ill. 4. Kelly was caught actually red-handed discarding the ileostomy bag. This happened weeks before Kelly managed to get the do not resuscitate order. According to Olivia's grandparents if any of the medical staff would have noticed any of these red flags and called social services, Olivia would be alive today. That would have saved her life. She'd still be with us today. We'd have custody of her. She'd still be with us. Unfortunately, Children's Hospital's ethics team voted against Do Dr. Walker and voted in favor of the mother. and the care was transferred from Dr. Walker to another doctor who agreed to sign the do not attempt resuscitation order. Problem is, Dr. Walker failed to pick up the phone, make one call to the outside social services or law enforcement, and that call would have saved Olivia's life. There were several nurses that actually went to Children's Hospital Child Protection Team and the social worker team and made complaints that they believed medical child abuse was going on. The Children's Hospital Child Protection Team and social worker team determined that those suspicions did not rise to the level that needed to be reported to the outside social services. These individual nurses and doctors not only could have gone to the outside agencies and reported the child abuse, they had a duty to report any suspicions of child abuse or medical child abuse to the authorities. The hospital settled for an undisclosed amount of money.